So a warm welcome to all of our Samaritan Advantage members and attendees while you're being welcomed from the lobby into our Samaritan Advantage Lunch and Learn webinar for today, November 9th, 2021. It's amazing how quickly this calendar year is going and we're already making plans for Thanksgiving 2021 and the holidays of 2021 when when COVID first started in March of uh, what was it 2020 now um, well at least in this area it started in other parts of the world back in that earlier winter part of 2019 but we wouldn't have thought that we were really going to be at the place where we're at today all those 18 months plus ago so really excited and honored that you're able to join us today and we have two great presenters from within our system, Samaritan Health Services, uh, that are going to give a, be giving uh, presentations on COVID-19 and what we can expect uh, moving forward. The first of our presenters is Helen Beeman, and our second presenter is Dr. Adam Brady, who is head of our SHS Corona Task Force uh, and also an infectious disease specialist. Uh, you will hear more of their bios as we uh, get going a little later on. For purposes of some uh, rule uh, attending to for the Advantage Lunch and Learn, um, please keep your voices on mute um, unless you're going to be asking a question later on in the discussion. It helps just decrease some of that feedback. Um, also, if this is your first time attending Teams meetings and you're seeing your screen freeze, uh, sometimes what you might need to do, it's based on your own Wi-Fi in your home and uh, you may have to reconnect on teams or uh, put your uh, camera um, off and, and just uh, listen in and that sometimes will help with some of those uh, wi-fi or bandwidth issues so without further ado um, we are going to get going with our uh, lunch and learn we are going to have the video recording sent out to you at a later date and attached with that video recording email is also a post uh, survey to fill out so we can hear how we did. Um, also part of that survey, we usually ask you ideas and um, 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 upcoming uh, Advantage Lunch and Learn webinar discussion items. So feel free to let us know what you would like to learn about in the future. And also as our thank you, because we can't get together live and have a lunch and learn event, we have a Subway $15 gift certificate that will be mailed out to you by snail mail. So it will go out to your mailboxes instead of anything done by email as a way to say thank you to you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Helen to introduce herself and then to uh, give her a uh, component of today's discussion. Helen. We're going to talk today about strategies for wellness during COVID-19. My talk will go for about 20 minutes and then you will get to hear the other presenter. So um, I'll just rely on our, our meeting moderators to let me know if I need to stop. And then um, if you didn't already see, we will answer any questions at the end of both talks so that both presenters have the most time possible to um, give you information. Again, my name is Helen Beeman. I have a master's of social work and I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Oregon. And I've been serving in a variety of different roles within Lynn, Benton and Lincoln counties. And I come to you today with a little over 22 years of experience in the medical, social and human service fields. Some of you may have even heard me speak um, at other lunch and learns over the last couple of years in my last role. Um, and I've also done a lot of different talks for other agencies and organizations. I'm going to start today by going over briefly some of COVID-19's impacts on our mental wellness. Then we'll talk about normal um, responses to a crisis, which, yes, I'm calling COVID-19 a crisis. Um, and if it hasn't felt like that to you, that is awesome. But I think for uh, many of us, uh, it's felt a lot like a big crisis. So we'll look at what some common um, responses have been to this. Then we'll talk about anxiety and depression. We'll go over what I mean when I say anxiety and depression, what that looks like as far as signs and symptoms. Then we'll talk about some coping strategies that you can use. And then we'll look at some resources that are available to you within the community. So impact on mental wellness. It's interesting now that um, 
interesting, not in a fun way, but <laughs> from a psychological standpoint to me, that our brain has now associated plenty of normal everyday things with um, being really, really fearful experiences. So things like leaving the house, being in a public setting, even sometimes us physically touching things, your brain may now perceive as threats to your safety. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience. I have it just about every time I watch TV, whether it's a TV series or a movie. I think the first time I noticed it recently, I was trying to go back and watch um, the really popular TV series Friends. And this was, of course, um, created in the 90s. And uh, I just felt this jolt of panic while I was watching one of the episodes. And of course, I'm a behaviorist, so I'm going to try to dial in and figure out what is happening for me right now. And I realized that a group of them had come in for a group hug, I think, in the little coffee shop setting. And my brain was like, whoa, danger, right? Why is everyone getting so close? Where are their masks? And this is an example of how my brain has now started to encode some very what used to be normal things with um, very real threats to safety. So um, if these odd occurrences have happened to you, just know that it makes sense um, from a, a psychological standpoint. We've seen an increase in agoraphobia. So people see this differently, but I think of it as um, a fear of kind of leaving the house um, or fear of being in social settings. So we've seen an uptick in this experience um, due to the pandemic. We've seen an increase in depression, anxiety, social isolation, and loneliness. So to clarify this bullet point, I would say some of this is an increase in the perception of experiencing things like depression, anxiety, feeling lonely, and there's also been an increase in the levels of diagnosable things that we're seeing in a clinical setting. The pandemic has also greatly limited our access to many of the healthy behaviors and self-care options that many of us use to manage our, our wellness and our health, um, or when we have experienced depression or anxiety, um, all the ways that we get back connected into our communities and regain a sense of health and wellness. I can tell you as a behaviorist, uh, it's been really, really challenging for my position because all of my go-tos, all of the things that I would normally recommend for people to engage in, they have barriers now because of the pandemic. I can't tell people, oh, you know, try to get into a group exercise class. The risk for each person is going to vary um, quite a bit. And so I, I don't have a lot of options as far as healthy behaviors and things that I would normally just um, offer to people. So it's really made it challenging to take good care of ourselves through all of this. Lastly, this has had a huge impact on grief and loss. So not only have many of our lives been touched by loss, um, specifically from the pandemic, but we've had normative losses throughout this time. And we have seen a huge disconnection from our loved ones, being able to be near them, being able to connect with them in all the ways. And then when someone has become sick or has passed, um, we often are not able to be at their bedside. And we've also been unable um, to some degree, I think it's getting better now, but in the thick of things, we were not able to have our funerals and other grief and loss rituals that would normally allow us to receive social support for those losses. So just to briefly go over normal responses to crisis, I want to go over this slide primarily because I want you to know that wherever you're at and however this experience um, has felt to you, it's normal. Um, whether it's been really awful, very scary, weird, um, I promise you it's normal. Other people are, are going through really, really bizarre, um, you know, kind of experiences of this whole pandemic. So if you've felt fearful at any point, um, questioning, am I safe? Will we be okay? Is the world coming to an end? Um, I don't know about your brain, but mine can get pretty dramatic and creative. So all of those things are normal. Feelings of anger, which I know a lot of people tangle with this, especially if you're a pretty even keel, soft tempered type of person. But many people have felt angry at different points through this process. 
um, questioning why we're not prepared for something like this, sometimes questioning leadership. Um, and, you know, the answer is nobody was really prepared for anything like this, but definitely feeling resentment or frustration is very normal. Feeling confused or frustrated. So what should I do right now? What does the future look like for me, for people that I love, things like that? Very, very normal. Experiencing guilt or self-blame. Should I have had a better plan? And then also this guilt around, it's almost survivor's guilt. So if things have gone okay for you during the pandemic, while you're simultaneously seeing so many people experiencing really, really challenging dynamics, um, a lot of us tend to feel guilty if we haven't been hit quite as hard by the impact of the pandemic. Shame and humiliation. Um, many people, if you're trying to, you know, not air your dirty laundry, so to speak, you're trying to keep things to yourself, you don't want to talk to your friends and family about the experiences that you're having with the pandemic. Um, we often feel very siloed and we feel like maybe we're the only ones experiencing these things. So I urge you, if you feel comfortable and you have good relationships with friends or family, if you let them know what you're experiencing, the odds are very likely that your friends and family are experiencing similar things. So some of us have had this experience where we feel like we're handling it much poorly compared to our peers, and that often is not the case. So sorrow and grief, definitely missing our routines, missing our friends, um, just really everything. There's been so much loss in probably every way possible throughout this entire pandemic um, that adjusting to the new normal is, is going to be a, a very difficult dynamic for many of us. So what is anxiety? For those of you who can't see the images here, this is a picture of an older adult female and it says on her forehead, how will tomorrow look? And many of us tangle with anxiety at some point in our lives, um, but I think in a situation like this, anxiety is really running rampant. If we were in person, I would open things up to you and ask you to start brainstorming what anxiety means to you, what it looks like to you, feels like to you. This is kind of the overarching description that I provide people with. So thinking about anxiety, we refer to it in the clinical setting as generalized anxiety disorder. It's a common but serious mood disorder, and the impact that anxiety can have on a person is continuum based. And so we can see very little anxiety that people maybe live with on a daily basis. It doesn't necessarily impact everything that they do, and they can manage it very well all the way to the other end of that spectrum where it can be really crippling for people if it's not managed well. Anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety disorder differs from normal feelings of nervousness or anxiousness that we attribute to just kind of being part of human and it involves excessive fear or anxiety and generalized anxiety disorder involves persistent and excessive worry that impacts daily activities and multiple domains of your life. And my slides are moving the opposite direction. <laughs> All right, so what are the symptoms of anxiety? Excessive worry, okay? A lot of times, especially with generalized anxiety disorder, your worries will often be very random and diverse. Um, many times they'll be about things that are pretty unlikely to happen, which the pandemic has shaken things up because most of us never in a million years in our lifetimes would have thought to worry about a pandemic type situation. Feelings of impending doom. If you've never had this symptom, um, that's awesome because it's pretty miserable. I can tell you I've experienced this myself. But for those of you who have experienced feelings of impending doom, I think many of us would describe it as this gut sense, right, in your stomach that says like, I shouldn't get out of bed today or today is gonna be a very bad, awful day. Um, and this is something that's generated by your brain when you're experiencing anxiety. Many people have nausea or other gastro issues. Heart palpitations. So sometimes people will feel like their heart is really beating out of their chest, very powerful and rapid. Some people experiencing, experience trembling. Some people can feel chest pain or chest pressure. I liken it to um, 
as if an uh, elephant is sitting on your chest and you just feel like you can't take a deep, full breath of air. Many people do experience difficulty breathing, muscle tension, body aches. Racing and intrusive thoughts. This is kind of hallmark for anxiety. So these are thoughts that just pop into your brain. You have not asked them to be there and they just keep rolling around and around and around begging for your attention. Many people experience fatigue. This is exhausting to feel anxious. Some people experience sweating. Um, a lot of people will call it stress sweating, which it feels very different. It can even smell differently than regular sweating. So this is your body just really in a state of stress. Parathesia or some tingling sensations. Often people might feel this in their hands or other extremities. Hypervigilance, so this is the experience of being very on guard. Um, you might startle easily, be checking over your back, just kind of overall very worried about your surroundings. Older adults in particular are more likely to experience irritability or having a shorter fuse when they're feeling anxious. I think being anxious just takes so much of your energy that it can shorten your fuse. If you're normally a very patient person, um, just know that that's not broken. And once your anxiety is managed, that will return back to you being a patient person. Psychomotor agitation, this is a fancy way of just saying really physically restless. Some people have uh, difficulty sitting still um, or they might be, you know, bouncing a leg or doing some some other repetitive motion just as kind of a physical way that the stress is trying to eke out. And then we often see changes in sleep or changes in diet. So both of these symptoms can go either way. Some people will try to sleep too much or they won't be able to sleep at all. And likewise, with diet changes, some people will eat more, eat less, or even make different dietary choices, depending on their response to the stress. So what is depression? Overarching description, when we're talking about depression, I'm referring to major depressive disorder or clinical depression. This is a common but serious mood disorder. Again, we don't consider it a normative part of aging, but at any given point, about 5% of older adults are experiencing a depressive episode. So it's something that if you've um, been diagnosed with depression in the past, it makes you a little bit more vulnerable to experiencing depressive episodes um, you know, as you go through life, but it's something that can come and go in our lives. It causes severe symptoms that affect how you feel, how you think, and handle daily activities. It impacts some of our most basic functioning, like sleeping, eating, socializing. And to be diagnosed with clinical depression, the symptoms have to be present for at least two weeks. Thinking about it before we break into actual signs and symptoms, um, if you have ever felt very tired, helpless, and hopeless, if you notice that you've lost interest in many of the activities and interests that you normally enjoy, if you have difficulty getting things done, sleeping, eating, and getting your normal functioning taken care of throughout the day, and if you felt that way more days than not for more than two weeks, you might be dealing with depression. So the symptoms are depression. You'll, you'll notice that some of them are the same as anxiety. They often, anxiety and depression don't play nice in the sand, sandbox, so to speak. So they do have some similar things and um, there is a causal link between them. Sometimes if we are depressed for long enough or if we're anxious long enough, it can really shift our brain chemistry. So anhedonia, I'm not sure if all of you have heard this term, but it's a pretty clinical term and it refers to that characteristic of the loss of interest or the inability to experience joy. And this would be something that many people don't necessarily tune into unless we ask them about it. So it's that part about thinking of like, what would you do to cheer yourself up? Or what would you do to go have fun and feel joy um, if you were having a hard time? And if you were to go and do that, would it still work for you? And sometimes when we're feeling depressed, um, those things just can't bring us joy. They can't break through. And that is a really, really big indication that you might want to have a conversation with your primary care doctor or your behavioral mental health provider that, um, you know, just to make sure that you're doing okay and you're, you have everything that you can going to help you feel better. Again, we see changes in sleep, diet, and weight, feelings of fatigue, 
Um, for many people experiencing depression, I'd say fatigue, just feeling like you have zero energy is very, very common. It's one of the most challenging factors in treating depression too, because a lot of the things that help manage depression involve getting you moving, getting you socializing, getting you, you know, re-engaged in activities that are helpful for you and meaningful for you. And when you feel so wiped out, um, that's one of the biggest things to overcome in managing depression. Many people experience difficulty concentrating, focusing, getting things done from start to finish, even memory issues. A lot of times people come to me in the clinics and they might be concerned they have a brain disease like Alzheimer's um, or some type of dementia. And I reassure them, you know, there's a lot that can look similar. So we always make sure that we rule out depression. Um, even when people are grieving a loss or several losses, it can have a lot of those memory and cognitive functioning um, symptoms. If your depression is really, really bad, um, some people experience psychotic symptoms, um, which a lot of people then get nervous that they have some sort of um, really serious mental disorder, but it is possible for you to experience um, delusional thinking, uh, hallucinations, things like that um, when you're in the thick of depression. And then thoughts about death um, can be uh, definitely a sign or symptom of depression. So this is when we're thinking about what if I just wasn't here tomorrow? You know, what if um, I didn't wake up in the morning? And I define these in two separate bullet points because suicidal ideation, which is our last bullet point, this is very different. This is when someone is really feeling um, entirely hopeless and they are actually thinking about ending their own life. So certainly those are the big red flags with depression and they are absolutely a result of when your brain is in this state. Um, so muscle tension, body aches, again, that is a shared symptom with anxiety, but depression physically hurts. We often see people with a disheveled appearance. It takes a lot of energy to keep ourselves put together. So a lot of times this will be something that gets, you know, falls by the wayside when you're feeling depressed. Feelings of guilt, this is a way that our thinking changes when we're depressed. Overwhelming sense of sadness, feeling hopeless, having a sense of social isolation or choosing to withdraw, mood swings and irritability, anxiety, and psychomotor retardation or psychomotor agitation, which again, it can go either way with depression. Some people become very physically restless and other people have the complete opposite. And if you've ever experienced this or seen a family or a friend experience this, when someone has such slowed um, psychomotor responses, I've seen people and they are moving so slowly, speaking so slowly, they actually kind of look like the zombie version of themselves. So sometimes it can be very, very apparent when someone's struggling with depression. So why do we care? Why is it so important that we have this conversation and that we understand how to recognize signs and symptoms of depression, anxiety, and then do whatever we can to get ourselves feeling better? These things impact our physical health. They impact our emotional well-being, our relationships, our social functioning, and overall our well-being and health, our quality of life. So this slide is just a snapshot to show you a couple different ways um, that you can approach coping for depression or anxiety, or if you're feeling socially isolated or lonely. And I use a lot of words that, you know, we kind of use in my profession, um, but they refer to pretty basic things. And as we go through the next couple of slides, I'll tell you different ways that you could get in touch with someone who does the type of work that I do, and they would be able to give you much more detail on these things. So behavioral activation is one of our first recommendations. It can be really hard if you're feeling low energy, fatigue, things like that, but it's just a fancy way of saying, get moving. Um, humans are not designed to be sedentary. So our first thing that we think about is how can we get you moving? How can we get you engaged in some sort of meaningful or pleasurable, if we're lucky, physical activity? I don't talk about the E word, which is exercise. You don't have to go to a gym. You don't have to go buy running shoes and train for a marathon. Just getting up and moving your body it will be very meaningful. Any ways that you can reduce stress in your life, the things that you can control obviously are your low-hanging fruit. Anything else you might want to work with somebody and talk about ways that you can try to have those stressors that are not under your control be less impactful on your health. 
diaphragmatic breathing exercises. So if you can see the image in front of you, that blue square down at the bottom, this is an example of one type of diaphragmatic breathing where we would help you basically calm your body and kick it out of a stress response, which if you're experiencing that, um, for some people, this helps them break out of a panic attack or an anxiety attack. Um, but for other people, it can be really useful for a number of different things. And then grounding. I normally refer to it as sensory grounding. The image of the person with their feet in the grass is very literally a type of grounding. Reconnects us to the present tense, which is just a really sneaky way that we distract our brains from whatever it's really worried about by drawing it into focusing on the present through using all of our senses. Other ways to get support locally. Lincoln County Mental Health is available to you. Samaritan Mental Health. Samaritan Behavioral Health. So the Behavioral Health refers to um, people like myself who are embedded within um, our primary care and family medicine clinics. Uh, we have a couple people that are in some of our specialty clinics as well. And then our mental health, those are our providers that do traditional mental health therapy. If you have any questions about getting connected to one of those providers, I recommend that you follow up with your primary care provider. If you're interested in doing primary uh, private practice, then you can go on to psychologytoday.com, and that's listed as our very last bullet point on this slide. You don't even have to spell it right. The internet will know where you want to go. And then once you get onto that website, you can type in your zip code. And then I recommend that you use the filters on that site after you typed in your zip code and just select your insurance, okay? And then filter that so that you know which providers will be covering the services for you. You can also look at pastoral counseling options if you're already connected. And peer counseling groups, which there's a number of different counseling groups in every community. Um, sometimes your primary care doctor might be able to help you get in tune. Otherwise, you can call your county mental health and ask them what's available. Or if you're connected to any mental health or behavioral health provider, we usually have our, our finger on the pulse of those things so we can guide you. So last, we're just going to co cover a couple um, really basic strategies on how to navigate social isolation and loneliness during the pandemic. I call this creating a new normal. Um, we can't change what's going on, so I recommend that you plan your information diet. Now, this means if watching the news and every morning you wake up, you reach for some sort of tablet or phone or computer and read up on COVID-19 and things that are going on, you might imagine that that contributes to your stress. So just make sure that you are limiting that as necessary for what you can handle. I immediately had to put some structure in on that and just say, you know, at this time every day, I get to have 10 minutes and I can peruse and make sure that I'm well informed, that I know what I need to know about what's changing, and then that's it, and I'm cut off. Um, and that was when we were on lockdown. So, you know, I could try to justify needing more information, but realistically, there wasn't any place that I was going to be going, and so I had to be really strict with myself so that I didn't create more anxiety. Try to maintain your routines and structure as much as possible. If things have really gradually fallen apart for you, start building back your routines and structure. It's so important for us. Try to maintain healthy eating. Try to maintain your sleep schedules. Really, it's, it's a back to basic situation with the pandemic. And if you can, do light to moderate physical activity, whatever your primary care doctor is advising, but making sure that we just don't get too sedentary. Um, certainly been limiting to try to get out and do all the things. I miss being able to go to exercise classes, which was one of the main ways that I was successful in actually exercising was that I knew I was accountable to go somewhere at a certain time and, and show up. And so it is a little bit more challenging, but it's very important. Use this time to find a new hobby. Okay, so obviously if you have hobbies that have just fallen by the wayside, try to pick those things up um, and get going again. I just put a couple of options on here. Of course, everybody's different in the things that they enjoy, but thinking about crocheting, knitting, things that you can do from home that are relatively inexpensive, online crafting tutorials, reading. I have a, you know, a huge stack of books that I finally have time to read now since I can't go anywhere else. Online cooking tutorials, bird watching. Try to learn something new, okay? This is neuroprotective, this is cardioprotective, so keep that brain working. 
Um, if you wanted to learn a new language, take up photography, just dancing, that's something you can do in your own home free of charge. Learning how to use a new technology or learning how to use a new feature or application or software with technology that you already know. Some of the ways that we can do this and get kind of buy one, get one free, if you will, is learning how to use online grocery delivery, learning how to use, you know, mail order prescription services, FaceTime, Skype, all of those things. We have kind of those secondary benefits now that we're cooped up for the time being. I urge you to reconnect with family and friends. Um, I don't know about you, but I love receiving actual letters, not bills <laughs> in the mail. So write a letter, write an email. It gives you an excuse to find some pretty new stationery. Check in on family and friends by phone or by text. It will help you just as much as it helps them. And try to take advantage of this time. I think if we forget um, that perception plays such a huge role in our experience of life, you can reframe this. This is a time that the universe has kind of said, we're all slowing down whether you like it or not. So just take it for what it is. Try to use this as a time to rest and relax. This is a great opportunity to reevaluate your current values and your goals and make sure that once things get going again, that you are living and doing things that you know are consistent with what your values are. And you can create future goals for yourself. If you need someone to listen, the Friendship Line is a California-based resource. It is a 1-800 number. So if you're using a cell phone, just remember this may use your minutes, but if you're on a landline, it will be toll free. It's completely confidential and it's a peer-based resource. So it's not gonna be a 20-something who picks up the phone right out of graduate school. These are not clinicians, they are peers and they are there to help any person age 60 years of age or older any adults with a disability 18 years of, of age or older or any caregiver of older adults or persons with disabilities and you don't have to prove any of this um, you can just call and they will be um, you know a person who can listen and connect the david rompery oregon warm line is the oregon version of the friendship line it is a peer run program. It's not 24 seven like the friendship line, but it's got really, really great hours. I think they're seven days a week. And again, it's an 800 number and we can send you, um, you know, either through snail mail or through email, we can send you a link for these um, resources. So you have the information in front of you. And then if you or anyone you know is experiencing suicidal ideation, we want to make sure that you have this line and this resource. This is a resource that can potentially save a life. So this is a crisis line, um, different from the two warm lines we just talked about. This is if somebody's in serious threat and these folks will help um, that person or yourself stay safe during your moment of crisis and get you connected with the things that you need to be safe. And that is the last of my slides. So I will turn it back over and uh, Dr. Brady is gonna take it from here. Great, thank you so much, Helen. And while Dr. Brady is getting his information up on the screen, I just wanted to say thank you to you uh, that the information you provided is so necessary for each and every one of us as we're making our way through the pandemic. Um, Dr. Brady is going to be next, and then we're going to have time at the very end of Dr. Brady's discussions to answer any questions uh, both from Helen and from Dr. Brady. So I will let Dr. Brady take it away and do introductions and then let us know the latest and greatest on COVID-19. All right, thank you, Dr. Wachena. Uh, thanks, Helen, for an excellent, excellent talk. Um, so I'm happy, happy to be here today. Again, my name is Adam Brady. I'm an infectious disease doctor here at Samaritan. I'm based in Corvallis, but we uh, uh, and I've, I've been helped coordinating the Samaritan's COVID-19 response um, throughout Lynn, Benton, and Lincoln counties um, since since actually January of 2020. So we're we're, we're almost two years into this uh, as far as the planning stages go. But I'm happy to talk today um, about COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, well, as we get started here, as far as an agenda, I'll we'll talk a little bit about myself, but the majority want to talk about the current state of COVID-19 vaccinations. Again, COVID-19, the landscape of vaccines and you know who should get vaccinated, who should get a booster has become very complicated. So hopefully we can kind of shed some light on that today. 
again, probably enough for a for an hour long talk on its own, but I think we'll we'll hit the high level points and and hopefully leave plenty of time for for questions. Um, we'll also go through, like I mentioned, local vaccination rates and also clarify the role of, of boosters uh, for folks as well. So about me, I did my undergraduate degree um, here in Corvallis at Oregon State um, in microbiology. I did my medical school at the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin, Ireland, where I spent four years um, in medical school. Uh, I did residency at University of Massachusetts in Worcester, Massachusetts, and then uh, finally got back home to Oregon where I did my fellowship in infectious disease. And I've been at Samaritan um, in my current role as um, an infectious disease clinician um, from 2016 um, through through the current time. And again, I've, I've been chairing our um, COVID-19 task force, which kind of, you know, at least early on really um, oversaw our, our response and continues to be active and, and trying to help keep um, patients and, and employees at Samaritan safe while uh, while we navigate the, the ongoing pandemic. So. Just to jump right in, this is a slide um, that's kind of busy, but shows the, the three currently available COVID-19 vaccines. And over time, we're keep I'm having to add to this table uh, uh, more and more, which I suppose is a good thing because more and more people are eligible for vaccination. So if we start in the first, the first um, uh, row here, the Pfizer, or the, sometimes called the BioNTech vaccine, um, is an mRNA vaccine. That's how it, that's the technology that it uses to train our bodies how to how to react uh, and fight to COVID uh, fight COVID nineteen. Uh, for ages sixteen and above, that's been actually FDA approved, and that's where this brand name called Comirnaty Comirnaty comes in. It's the same vaccine, but it's been FDA approved now for for people age sixteen and up. Um, EUA means emergency use authorization. So this is a this is a tool that the FDA has to allow you know. Uh, use of a vaccine when the, the benefits far outweigh the risks in time of emergency. And that's, you know, we're currently in the, the emergency state still of the pandemic as it as it drags on. Um, so that's available under under emergency use for, for now, newly five, eight people ages 5 to 11 and also um, 12 to 15. The Moderna vaccine uses very similar technology as the Pfizer vaccine, um, uses mRNA or messenger RNA. Um, and that's authorized for use in people 18 and above. And then there's the the Janssen vaccine or Johnson and Johnson, which is more commonly known, which uses a little bit different way of, of training our body how to fight COVID. It's something called an adenoviral vector vaccine. I'm not going to go into detail about how the vaccines work again because uh, we're limited on time, but just to know that that's um, a, a vaccine that's available uh, for 18 and above as well. So. Over time, again, since vaccines were, were more wide, were widely available, or, or I suppose became available back in um, the middle part of December 2020, um, there's been varying um, sort of success stories in, uh, in, in different countries. In the United States, you know, while we started very fast, we're the United States, you can see here in the, in the, the maroon line, uh, started very fast and one of the earliest to, to start vaccinating people back then in, in December uh, 2020. But over time, other countries have done a better job at vaccinating more shares of their population. You can see Portugal, especially with you know well over 90% now of their their uh, or nearly 90% of their vac uh, population vaccinated uh, for COVID-19. And the United States have fallen behind many you know many countries uh, with our current vaccination rate, which is in the mid to upper 60% range uh, uh, of the total population. <laughs> So more locally, um, there's also kind of a wide, uh, a wide spread of vaccination rates, um, you know, even in our sort of three county area. So the United States, like I mentioned, 68% of all of the entire population, this is just not, not just adults, but the entire population of the country has received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, Oregon is, is right around there at 67% of the population being fully vaccinated or having one dose of vaccine. Now, uh, Lincoln County and Benton County um, have higher rates than the state and the, the countrywide average, 71 and 73 percent of people having first doses of vaccine, uh, respectively. But Lynn County has, has lagged behind somewhat, 55 percent of uh, the population of Lynn County has received at least one dose of um, COVID-19 vaccine. In Oregon, you know, if we look at Oregon over time, also um, as a state, like I mentioned, we're at 67. If we round up 66.5%, um, you know, 67%, or you know, one in three of uh, two and three people in, in uh, Oregon have been vaccinated with at least one dose of vaccine. 
And we had, you know, really steep increase in the rates of vaccinations of early on through February and through June, but it's really been a plateau and kind of a slog since then to, to increase vaccination rates. But nevertheless, we, we are making some progress. Um, the goal of the state is to get 80% of the total population vaccinated in Oregon. And on the bottom here, we have about 576,000 people to go um, before we reach 80% of the population vaccinated. Now down here in green, you know, as of as of October or late September, so we started giving extra doses or booster doses of vaccine, and 10% of the population has actually received a booster dose, and that's what we're going to spend the most of the most of the talk here, uh, rest of the talk talking about. So, question I get all the time is, you know, why do some people need boosters? You know, does that mean the vaccine isn't isn't working, or you know, maybe I don't want to get the vaccine at all because you know I'm just going to have to get a booster, or you know maybe get a booster you know, on a regular interval in the future. But the reason why some people need boosters is that, you know, early on things were great. Um, you know, the vaccines were extremely effective at preventing COVID-19 infection. You know, when the studies first came out and when, you know, real world uh, information started coming in, the, the vaccine prevented, uh, you know, made it 95% less likely that you would get um, COVID-19 compared to somebody who was unvaccinated. So, you know, a nine, that's what we call an efficacy rate, a 95% effective at preventing COVID-19, which was, which was great. Um, but over time, that, that number has gone down and it's probably somewhere now in the, the uh, after two doses of vaccine, uh, for mRNA at least, it's gone down because of a couple of reasons, um, probably around 70, 70% or so. So over time, um, you know, immune system, you know, your uh, uh, your immunity can wane, which means over time you can become more successful uh, or more susceptible to infection. So um, now that happened around the same time, you know, about six months after most people got vaccinated, the Delta variant came along and the Delta variant was more infectious. It was better at infecting people. Um, and that combination caused, you know, the 95% the vaccination um, effectiveness rate to go down. But um, thankfully, the vaccines have met, remained very effective at preventing severe infections from and preventing death from COVID-19 uh, for most people. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as well. The effectiveness has, for preventing any infection at all has gone down somewhat. So first of all, what is a booster dose? And you know, this is a just a schematic looking at the you know um, a theoretical um, mRNA vaccine, for example. And so how you can look at this is you know uh, on this side of things, you know, the higher the line is on this side where it says antibodies, the more antibodies you have to fight COVID-19. Antibodies are a way that you know we can prevent COVID from causing an infection or causing a severe infection. Now. You know, all of us before we got vaccinated, we didn't really have a whole lot of antibodies to COVID-19 because this is a brand new virus. So what happens is, if after you get your first dose, your your body makes some antibodies to, to COVID-19, and um, but it's not not a ton. It's not full protection, and that may go down a little bit. Now that for the second dose, you make even more antibodies, and those are more uh, prolonged over time. But as time has gone on here, you can see that you know levels of antibodies have gone down, and then this big yellow virus picture here is supposed to represent the Delta variant. So when the Delta variant came along, um, there was a uh, decrease in the effectiveness of the vaccine, um, just because that time has gone along uh, quite, a, quite a bit as well. And that's where the third dose or the booster doses come in to really restore that antibody level, restore that protection against COVID-19 um, that we saw early on in the, in the vaccine campaign. So, and I think to answer one of the one of the issues I mentioned before is I hear from a lot of people that says, oh, you can you can get you can get COVID-19 even if you're vaccinated. So I'm just not going to bother. It doesn't make any sense for me to get vaccinated. And so, you know, I think um, while that's true, again, no vaccine has prevented, you know, 100 percent of the infections that it's uh, designed to uh, protect against. It doesn't really show the whole picture. So. What this is, what this schematic is, um, is showing the spectrum of COVID-19 infection um, in an unvaccinated person. So, again, you know, there are a few people, or you know, a, a portion of people here who might remain asymptomatic, so they have no symptoms at all. Um, another portion that could be posse symptomatic, which means very few symptoms from COVID-19. And then, as we step up, there's uh, folks that have a cold-like, cold-like illness, maybe a flu-like illness. And there's a significant chunk of people who may, might become hospitalized, require the ICU, or even die from COVID-19. And that's kind of what that spectrum looks like in an unvaccinated person. Now, if we look at someone who was vaccinated recently, say in the last you know month or two or, or three, 
um, it's very effective still at preventing cases of infection. So, you know, the majority of the time, you're not getting infected at all if you're vaccinated. Now, it is true that you can get COVID-19 if you are vaccinated, but, you know, all of this we see up here, you know, asymptomatic, quasi-symptomatic, cold, flu-like illness, hospitalization, death, and ICU, it's all crammed in, you know, right over here. So it's it's all it's all much more rare um, than, if it, than if you were um, unvaccinated in the first place. Now, over time, what's happened is, you know, the vaccine has become less effective. So this is some, somebody perhaps six months after they've completed their vaccination, where again, you're still having, you're having protection against the vaccine, but it's not like it was back, you know, right, right after you were vaccinated. So, and again, the after you're fully vaccinated, the spectrum shifts quite a bit as well. You can see there are very few people being hospitalized. There's even fewer people dying from COVID-19. And if you happen to get infected, you're likely to have either no symptoms at all or very few symptoms or a cold-like illness. And, you know, the rate of severe infection after you're fully vaccinated, even if you're six months after vaccination, uh, is, uh, is low. You're not a lot of people. And again, um, there are exceptions, but again, um, the vast majority of folks, um, uh, you're preventing severe infection or hospitalization and death from COVID-19. So our goal with booster doses is essentially to return to uh, how it looks here in the middle, where most people don't get infect infected at all, um, and we reduce the amount of people uh, being hospitalized or having uh, potential for severe infection. So, you know, after the Delta variant came along, um, studies have shown that fully vaccinated people, and this is just another way to, to say what we were saying before on the previous slide, Fully vaccinated people had a reduced risk of infection by five times compared to someone who was unvaccinated. Um, they were uh, 10 times less likely to be hospitalized and 10 times less likely to die. Or another way to say it is if you're un unvaccinated, you're five times more likely to get COVID-19 in the first place. And you're over 10 times more likely to either get hospitalized or die from COVID-19 compared to someone like you who, might have not, who had been fully vaccinated. So, now, not everyone, you know, everyone is a little bit different. Our immune systems are, are different as we age, and um, not everyone, you know, was recommended initially to get a booster dose. So for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which are those two-dose mRNA vaccines, um, people who are 65 years and older seem to have um, a higher risk of severe infection and hospitalization the further out you get from a COVID-19 uh, vaccine series. So everyone 65 years and older is recommended to get a, a third dose of either Pfizer or Moderna vaccine six months uh, after their second dose. Now, that's a full dose of the Pfizer vaccine and that's a half dose of the Moderna vaccine uh, as well, but uh, people who are giving vaccine should be able to, to, to know what, what dose that you need. We also recommend that people 18 and up that are in high risk situations like living in long term care who have underlying medical conditions or live and work in high risk settings uh, consider getting a booster as well. Now, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine has uh, become even less effective over time than the mRNA vaccines and, and again that's a single dose vaccine. So the CDC has recommended that everyone aged 18 or older get a second dose of vaccine at least two months after their first dose of the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, as well. So how does that look then for, you know, the current landscape? And I'm, I'm, I kind of, you know, work more visually than words. So hopefully this kind of helps um, show what the, the full landscape looks like. Um, this is starting with the Pfizer va va uh, vaccine. And like I mentioned, the Pfizer vaccine was recently authorized for use in ages 5 to 11. Um, no booster is recommended for ages 5 to 11. It's just a two-dose vaccine. And, you know, whether or not there will be boosters in the future, I think time, time will tell. Now, if you're 12 and over and you're not significantly immunocompromised, meaning you're, you have a relatively normal immune system, it's recommended that your primary series or the regular um, course of Pfizer vaccine is two doses separated by 21 days. If you have significant um, immune compromise, like moderate or severe, they call it, these are things like on chemotherapy or you have high doses of steroids that you take or you have a bone marrow transplant, um, you're actually recommended to get three doses up front of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, separated by three weeks after the first and four weeks after the second. Now, where the booster doses come in here is if you're uh, 18 and older and it's been six months since you've gotten the vaccine and you meet one of those criteria we talked about before, it's recommended to get a booster dose, um, which would be either a third dose if you're not immunocompromised or actually a fourth dose if you are immunocompromised. 
Uh, and you can actually get Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson as your, as your booster dose. And we'll talk about a little bit of the nuance uh, there, what, what you should choose uh, in a little while. Moderna, a little bit simpler because we don't have um, pediatric vaccines yet. It's just 18 and above, but same, same idea. We have 28 days between the first two doses. And then we have a uh, three doses for people who are immune compromised. And again, six months or, or at, six months or so after that last dose, um, people who are eligible can get a booster dose of either vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson. Now with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, again, it's just a single dose up front. And then it's two months and everyone over 18 is recommended to get either Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson to increase the effectiveness of, of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So again, going back to this slide, uh, most people getting, again, this applies to Pfizer and Moderna mostly. Now, you know, first dose, you get your second dose, and now if you've gotten your booster dose, you've had antibodies come back up. And the question we always get, which is why there's a question mark here, is are we going to have to get boosters every year? Is it going to be every six months? And, and again, the answer to that question isn't, isn't known, um, and, it, and it's difficult to know. You know, we do have some vaccine series that are three doses, um, and they they confer very long protection. And it may turn out that these vaccines are essentially three dose vaccines. But as time goes on, we don't know what COVID-19 is going to look like in, you know, say another six months. Um, and so I, I think there's a good chance that it could last for a long time. But there's also, it's not out of the realm of possibility that depending on the spread and if any further changes to the virus, you know, we, we may need uh, additional doses. It's just too, it's just too soon to know. So booster side effects. Um, so booster side effects seem to be very similar to the previous doses of vaccine. Um, fever, headache, fatigue, chills, and arm pain seem to be the most common. And serious side effects remain very rare. Now we mentioned mixing and matching of booster doses, which means you know you're you're allowed essentially to choose a different vaccine for your booster than the than the previous um, than the vaccine that you had as your original dose. So. Any vaccine type can be used as a booster dose, but it doesn't seem like all of these vaccines are created equal. So my personal uh, recommendation, again, uh, depends on things like your, your situation recommendations from your doctor, but it seems at least in the lab studies that if you had Pfizer or Moderna for your original vaccine series, it makes the most sense to either get Pfizer or Moderna uh, for your uh, either or for your booster booster dose. Um, if you had Johnson & Johnson, it seems like getting a dose, second dose of Pfizer or Moderna is probably best. It, it probably increases your immunity a little bit better than the second dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Again, assuming that you didn't get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because you were not able for, for uh, reasons of allergy, et cetera, to get your um, initial uh, mRNA vaccine. Well, so in summary, over, over time, the vaccine effectiveness of COVID-19 uh, vaccines have has decreased um, and it's gotten lower against preventing just cases of COVID-19. Uh, in most people, uh, vaccines remain very effective at preventing um, severe disease and death from COVID-19. And certain people, um, especially people over the age of 65, would benefit from a booster dose more than others. And that's where the recommendation came in. Now, you know, even today, Pfizer has asked for authorization for all adults to receive booster doses. And I think eventually with more data coming out, I think we will see a recommendation for all adults to, to get booster doses of vaccine, but it's not, we're not quite there yet from a, from a, a clinical trial and a, and a data perspective. Um, side effects are mild and you can pretty much um, expect um, the similar side effects to your initial doses of vaccine and serious uh, reactions to this vaccine continue to be very rare. So how to get vaccinated, just to wrap up here, uh, samhealth.org slash get the vaccine is regularly updated with uh, information on how to access the vaccine through Samaritan and through county health department uh, partners. Uh, we're doing walk-in vaccines at Samcare Express or drop-in vaccines at Samcare Express in Albany and Corvallis. You can just go and get your booster dose anytime. They're open. Newport Walk-in Clinic and the Samaritan Coastal Clinic in Lincoln City are also open for vaccinations. Uh, and the local pharmacies, uh, a whole list there. Most pharmacies around will have vaccines available. And this vaccines.gov slash search, you can customize based on the type of vaccine in your location, and they'll tell you who has vaccines that are in stock. So just, just to wrap up, you know, vaccination is really the best way to, one, reduce your chances of getting COVID-19. Again, even with reduced effectiveness, it's the best way to reduce your chance of getting sick from COVID-19. 
Also makes it less likely that you'll infect other people, including your household member household members, if you do get sick. Um, dramatically reduces your chances of becoming hospitalized or dying from from COVID-19. Protects those uh, protects you and those who work and live with you. And also decreases the impact of COVID-19 on society, which you know the impacts have been have been major, and and also the healthcare system. So. Uh, I know we don't have too much uh, time, but I wanted to uh, to thank you all for your uh, attention, and I'm happy to uh, to take any questions that that we, uh, you may have. So thank you all for attending today. And yes, we have time for a few questions for both Dr. Brady and Helen. And um, what we'll do is I'll try to monitor who might have their hand up either electronically using the app or just raising uh, your hand, and I'll call upon you. Um, so anybody or just shout out your questions you might have. I'm just looking at the attendees with the phone numbers to see if I see any hands raised and I don't. So Dr. Brady, is there a good place to go to for information that helps decrease any myths, either about vaccines for COVID-19 or any myths about COVID-19 infections? Is there a well-respected well place to go for information? Yeah, you know, it, you know it, it's kind of the wild west out there, you know, when you're Googling information about COVID-19 vaccines. Um, you know, the, the CDC, and I don't have the link off the top of my head, maybe I can put it in the chat um, and find it find it after we're done here, but the CDC and through the, the Department of Health and Human Services has a pretty good document that addresses um, common myths and, you know, uh, debunks them essentially uh, about the COVID-19 vaccine, so I can try to get that information out to you. Okay, thank you. Well, I appreciate everybody's participation today. Looks like both Helen and Dr. Brady had a lot of information your way. And uh, as a reminder, again, we will be sending out this video recording after about a week or so. Give us some time to do some editing. That will show up in your email inbox and you can rewatch uh, this uh, recording as well. There will be a survey that's attached to that email so you can let us know how uh, this session went. Also giving us some thoughts of uh, um, sessions in the future and topics that you would like to see. And then lastly, just watch for that snail mail subway $15 gift certificate uh, on behalf of Samaritan Advantage. We're really happy that you are our healthcare members. Um, we as a health plan are very, very happy. We're part of an integrated delivery system like Samaritan Health Services, where we hate, have great clinicians in our midst. And at the end of the day, I want you to keep yourself safe and happy, and we will connect again at our next Advantage Lunch and Learn webinar. So thank you for joining us.